My name is Mel Novak. I too have love and lost. Well, I was uh, raised in a family where, where there was love, a mother, father, and I had a brother, Robert. And uh, they were there. They were there for me. My mom was the one who made us go to church all the time. And uh, I raised my two daughters and I had that love ethic raising my children because it's, that, that's what I had growing up. They were there, supported me when I played sports. And uh, it, it was a good time. I have great memories, great memories. And uh, you mentioned your career as an athlete. Can you tell us a little bit more about that and the loss of that experience? What was it like? Yeah, since I was three years old, I always wanted to play professional baseball. And uh, in high school, I had 60 scholarships all over the country, major universities. I had an appointment from Annapolis Naval Academy. And uh, I had scholarships for basketball. I was in track, I was fast, around 100 yards in 9.7, 9.6, and that was real. But sports was, was really my focus. And I was playing at an all-star game and I hit a ball about 420 feet. <clears throat> As I was running around the bases, a little voice said, you better go play baseball because if you go play football, you might get hurt and never play baseball again. Well, I never got hurt in football. I played offense and defense, all-star all teams and whatnot. <clears throat> and uh, in baseball, I had a massive rotator cuff tear. They had in a paper, he could be a superstar with his ability and talent, unless he got hurt. But we know that he had that great football background. We're not worried about that. While it didn't happen, they butchered me. I got like a 17 inch scar. They took my arm apart. I was crippled for five and a half years. And that was devastating. I lost. When I had a goal since I was a kid, and uh, but God still had His hand on me because 99 percent that are 19 that had where it happens to them, they'll turn to drugs or alcohol. I never drank, and I'm Serbian. Serbian is notorious drinker. Never drank. I was around drugs in Hollywood all the time. I never did drugs. Let's talk a little bit more. About going back to your uh, baseball experience. Um, can you tell us specifically what exactly happened um, and where were you when it happened and when it did happen? How had it, um, what was your initial love loss reaction? I know you mentioned you were devastated, but for all the yeah. other people out there. It's even worse than devastated because when I went to, the, I had a 37 pound uh, uh one of those casts like this. And when they took it off, I thought I, thought I was going to throw the ball around. Well, they took it off and, and moved my arm down. I passed off in pain. And a week later, went into the doctors, and this is where, where it really hit me. He says to me, look, kid, do you ever think you're going to play ball again, play anything, do anything again? Forget it. You're going to be a cripple for the rest of your life. And I took his streetcar home from Oakland, I, Pennsylvania to home, it took like 45 minutes, cried all the way. I mean, it was brutal. And people would say, you should have gone to college. You could have been pro, pro football by now. Look at you now, you're a cripple. Mm -hmm. it, it was, see, people's tongues are like caustic acid that really brought harm. Mm -hmm. But I had to live with it. My mother used to say, Mel, honey, God got something better. I don't want to hear it. I'm a cripple. Everything's gone. But see, God had a plan. Yeah. When you were, um, how long did it take for you to heal? And then um, during the process, how long did it take you to actually finally feel like this is something I can live with? You know, when it took over six years. And on the seventh year, where I was really, you know, buff. I mean, when I started out, I was like picking up 
you know, half a pound trying to move it. It took a long time. I persevered and I, I never give up. Like I always tell people, Luke 18, 1, don't give up, keep on praying. This is what I did. And it took that time. Then I went to a small NAIA school called Geneva Christian School. I was third in the country, pass catching and kicking. And Carnegie Tech turned me in for being a professional. Lost a scholarship. There you are again, another loss. And I said, you know, and if people kept again, the what negative the, stuff. What were the symptoms of love loss in that time? You, you, you like, it makes you sick in your inside. It, it's like, and then, that demon spirit of hopelessness. See, hopelessness is the devastating, most devastating emotion in the world. Mm -hmm. And I, I was floundering. What am I going to do? So I decided I'm going to I'm going to go to California. There was a friend of mine that I played pro ball with. He and his wife had an apartment house, and I went and moved out there. I had to leave all that negative stuff behind. And except the only thing was my, my, my family stood by me. Yeah. And my mother used to cry a lot. She'd see me. Because, you know, I was always happy and joyful. And all at once, I was like Dr. Doom. Mm -hmm. And that was six years of that? Yeah. And during that time, what helped you? Okay, so during the six years, you were, you know, were you up and down or were you just down all the way? It was down. Then you ride the roller coaster up and down. but. Uh, when I was coming home from uh, the spring training where the shoulder just was gone, right. I was at the, uh, the airport and I was crying. Mm -hmm. And I had this, this book, this, this black minister came over to me and says, what, what's going on, son? So I told him what happened and he looked down and the book I had was life of Jesus yeah. and he says well you're on the right track son I still remember that just a random stranger came yeah. up to you on the airport see the airport. we have divine appointments and I've had them everywhere mm -hmm. and that was a very you know rather than uh, I never ever thought about suicide I never thought about uh, just belly out in life and I didn't escape, numb, numb the pain or medicate the pain with, with, with alcohol or drugs. It was around all the time, wouldn't do it. So how did you cope then during that dark moment? Six years is a long time. I cried out to God. Mm -hmm. Psalm, Psalm 30 verse two, Lord my God, I cried out to you and you healed me. I cried for, you know, not, hardly anybody knows this, but whenever it be a big thunderstorm, lightning, I used to go outside and say to God, let a lightning bolt hit my shoulder to melt the pin so I could play ball again. I mean, how dumb is that? Prayer answered, and the devil's whispering, well, God can't do that. Liar. John 8, 44. Man. Jesus called him a liar. That's the right. father of all liars. You right. can't listen to that. You must listen to the word. What does what what the, the Lord say? say? The yeah. word. God healed me of cancer. There's other people I prayed for. They had a miracle, God. There's other people I prayed for. They got promoted. They, they went home with the Lord. I'm not seeing nor ear heard. Neither have entered into the hearts of man. Things of God prepared for them to love. 1 Corinthians 2 9. We can't even imagine that. You look at Revelation 21 4. I, it says, there'll be no more tears, no more suffering, no more pain, no more sickness, no more disease. All these no mores. To be with Him, how long? Ever and ever and ever. You're going to have millions who would have, could have, should have, and didn't. But it's their choice. Then you got you got people in in, in a POW camp, prisoner of war. Don't have time for prayer. Don't have time for the word. Don't have time for praise. Don't dress for the battle. POW, MIA, missing in action. Second Timothy two twenty five. Perhaps God will grant them repentance that they may see the truth and come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil, have them taken captive by him to do his will. He doesn't have the authority to do that. Are you prayed up with your armor every day? It's a command, Ephesians 6, 11.
surgery, it, uh, they literally butchered me, and I was crippled five years. And uh, that's about the time, at the end of that period, I came out to California. I got tired of people telling me what I should have done. I could have been a football star. You know, it gets old when you're, when you're down. People should not kick people. This is what encouragement's about. And uh, so when I came out here, I started uh, working at a, an insurance company. And one of the gals there said, you know, I wear a lot, my, my signature is suits. I have custom suits, two-tone shoes, I'm old school. She said, you look great in clothes. I have a modeling uh, cousin that's a modeling agent. I, you would like to meet her? I said, sure. So I started modeling. Then I started going to acting schools. And it wasn't, when it wasn't anything that I really wanted to come out here and do. I just had to get away from the negative uh, people who would try to stay in the past. You know, we all make choices. Obviously, my choice wasn't the right one, but I never gave up. I don't ever quit. And uh, first, I did some television. The first big movie was uh, Black Ball Jones. And it was the third biggest moneymaker that year, uh, Warner Brothers. And Robert Klaus was the director. I did my own fights and stunts. And they had stuntmen there, the karate guys. But my, my, my scenes and the fights were done in slow motion. It was so, so real. He's the one that took me to Hong Kong to do the game of death with Bruce Lee. And uh, I was there seven weeks. You know, that was the one that most everybody in the world has seen. And uh, I guess it was uh, 33 years ago, Union Rescue Mission, a skid row called me to be like a celebrity guest at the Easter sunrise service. So that's where my, my ministry started. And uh, the CEO saw me with a bunch of about 25 street people for like a half hour, an hour hanging on my, my words. I started doing services there. The LA mission, Fred Jordan and one of the guys came out of LA County Jail. Uh, he was uh, in, a, in a spiritual growth program. So he called the, the chaplain over there and he had spent time in, in San Quentin and told him, and he was a big Bruce Lee fan. So when he told him, Stick the assassin from Game of Death is down here. He wants to come and minister. So I started doing services there at County Jail. And then we went to uh, an ex-mafia guy, that chaplain, Marcel, and, and a pastor, myself, we went for all we knew, Jersey, level four. Level fours are the worst in the world. Level fours in New York and Pennsylvania. And before you know it, my whole life was, was around ministering in Skid Row in prisons and playing villains in movies, which I enjoy. I really like playing villains. I just finished one. Uh, they're in post-production called Syndicate Smasher. Shot a lot of people in that one, and I use blanks. So you mentioned that you are still doing movies now. Yes. Can you talk, about, um, can you talk about that, what you're doing with film right now? Yeah, it's amazing. A year. Last year, 2014, I didn't do one movie, but I had 268 services in Skid Row and prisons. This year, starting in January, uh, I've done five feature films, three star, two starring and three co-starring. And Gregory Hatanaka is a producer director on Samurai Cop. And he was another one that loved the Bruce Lee movie. He wanted to work with me for 10 years. It finally happened, I get a great role. In fact, uh, tomorrow I'm going to Portland. They have a, a premiere Friday. Then I'm going to fly back Saturday. We had a big premiere in Los Angeles that was 
totally sold out for that whole week. And then I went back to North Carolina, did Checkpoint, a big budgeted, many, many stars in there. A lot of my scenes was with uh, William Forsythe, you know, real, really great actor. And Thomas Churchill was a director, very talented. I loved working for him. And uh, he's already signed me to do two other pictures when they get the funding. And then they did uh, uh, Syndicate Smasher, which I had the main role. My billing was above the title. And uh, there were some people in Cincinnati who contacted me, wanted me to come back there and do the end of their movie so I could be, have a starring role in, in a sequel. And I said, I really didn't want to go back there. You got to change planes. You're stuck at the airport. So I said, you know, just give it to someone else. So they, they kept after me, and they sent people out here. And I, I did, did the ending out here, which they loved, and I'm excited to do that. Remember, remember Goodfellas? This is Badfellas, because, you know, the, the head dons are, are black in this, and uh, William Lee is the director, producer. So I'm looking forward to that. And, uh, and then there's two more that I'm to do. One's with Gregory Hatanaka called Darling Nikki, co-starring role. And I'm waiting on, uh, but Keith Burroughs and his wife, Tatanya, uh, super, super people. Uh, I, could, I could call them, got to know them as friends, which I don't use loosely in Hollywood. And uh, they have a 10 picture deal. They have the funding for it. So they already got me set up. So there's a ghost story. I don't know if they're going to start it before the next year. And then there, the other one they did in Morocco. Uh, I can't think of the name of it. They still got 12 more days in the prison thing. So it's been, it's been an incredibly busy year. I never did that in my life. To do five, and it'll be two more, seven pictures in one year. Never. So, you know, it's like, God bless me. I can tell you that. And they were all fun. And then in, uh, in Samurai Cop Deadly Vengeance, I got killed. So Gregory came to me and says, we're going to do a sequel and I have a starring role for you. I said, how are you going to do that? He said, we're going to start it off with you, same wardrobe, getting up, and taking the bullets out. You had a bulletproof vest. And you're really ticked off. I said, that'll work for me. So it, it's a, it just, you never know about that business. But it never bothered me because I'd go to Skid Row. You see the brokenness. You see people have nothing addicted to drugs or alcohol. And I mean, it, it just, I never get used to it. I've been there so long. You see the pain and the wounds and Violence, a lot of violence down there. And when I started out in prison ministry, there were 750,000 men and women born anywhere in the world. Today, there are 7 million, 14 million on parole. See, you see how the family structure is gone in our country. And people want to do things, make choices that they're going to end up spending time. about where it is and what is the situation like and how more details about how you got involved with this mission? Well, there's uh, downtown L.A., you have four Skid Row missions. Some of them, like Union Rescue Mission, they have to pay. If you want to stay there all month, they have paid $220 a month. So when they get their GR check, general relief, that's what they do. At least they're safe off the street. You got people sleeping on the sidewalks, tents everywhere. Uh, the population has tripled since I started. And uh, like I say, it was, it was God's plan, not mine, because I went there literally as a celebrity. And, uh, and I get a lot of favor there. 
So what I do is they have chapel services. And I have like a captive audience. They have to listen before they eat. And then you have, uh, I counsel. I've given that probably 300,000 Bibles. I've given that probably well over 1,900 pair of reading glasses, devotionals. And, you know, you just reach out and help. And uh, from the Skid Row, it translated right into the prison ministry. Skid Row is a prison without bars, the people that were there. And a real prison, not good. Not good at all. I see so much violence. I see so much hate, so much anger. And once that anger turns into bitterness, they're in a, we're in a world of trouble. But it's been, uh, I think the last 20, 21 years, I've done over 5,000 services. And, uh, you know, I'll continue till I stop breathing. I'm not, there's no retiring. The same thing with, with film work, you know, it's just, it, it's been incredible. And next year, I mean, I'm signed for some, you know, there's a sequel to Checkpoint. And, uh, when I, I was back in North Carolina, they had like, had about 40 or 50 extras in a church. I play this small town pastor, but I have things going on which are not really biblical. And uh, that's when I, I go to San Francisco, there's cells up there. And a lot of people get taken out in that movie. I'm ordained. I'm ordained minister. I do not have a church. Mm -hmm. My church is Skid Row and Prisons. Mm -hmm. uh, I love to go be a guest speaker in a church. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody has a knife. There's no riots. Uh, nobody's bringing drugs in. It's like going on a picnic with chicken and lemonade. But, you know, I just go where, where it's needed. It's not easy. There's no paycheck. I have a nonprofit corporation, Heavenly Mana Inc., 501c3, owes me over fifty thousand dollars since '93. But you know, God takes care of my needs. Philippians 4:19, not my greeds. I have more than I ever needed. So the situation is really bad down in Skid Row. Yeah. Does that ever affect your emotions? Does that ever affect your work? That's, that's a very good question. There's sometimes I come home and cry. I've never been able to leave it. When you see human beings that are totally destroyed, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, physically, psychologically, financially, morally, marriages go, and you see them, I've seen people OD on drugs and die. I had two guys that I knew, they had a fight right outside of Fred Jordan Mission. The one whooped the other one. He should have gone home, stayed there for a couple of weeks. He came back with a butcher knife, cut the guy's jugular, killed him, and he, he got 25 to life. This is the thing of life is so short. Forgiven 70 by strength, 80 years of age, and for for people to, to take a chance to really mess their lives up. I've, I've known lawyers down there. They lost their practice, their marriage, their, their holdings, their finance, everything. They got addicted to drugs. And that one, he's somewhere in his little podunk apartment. He's telling his girlfriend, get up, get up, get up. Well, she OD'd on drugs and died. This is, and the crystal meth is so poisonous, so dangerous, the teeth fall out. I see them in, in, in the Chino Women's Prison. They go, hi, Mel. See three teeth? You know, they did crystal meth. Then your skin goes. In two years, you don't even know who that person is. And it's so addictive. And I was shocked to find out, you know, I, I go to, my daughter Leah lives in Tualatin, Oregon. And I have grandkids, so I go there, 
and I go to Vancouver, Washington to minister. Prisons, churches, they're the, they're the meth capital of the United States, Oregon and Washington. I thought it was LA, California. But this is how it is. It's, uh, it's, it's hard. It's really hard when I leave. You know, it's like God healed me. I had prostate cancer. I didn't, wouldn't let them do anything. It took a while. He healed me there. I've had 10 throat surgeries in 10 years, 18 to 28. I can talk. That's why I play villains in movies, but I never, ever use God's name in vain. I wouldn't do anything to desecrate that. Uh, I've had 27 surgeries. I should have died seven times. And again, I never did drugs or alcohol. I had nothing to do with that. So I understand when somebody's going through these things and you know, I pray for them and everything, but I, I can't just get them, get out of Skid Row, stop the drugs. It's, it's a choice. It's hard. But, uh, and then a juvenile. When I, I, do, I go to East L.A. Juvenile, I do one of those services. By the time I come home, I'm down for the count for the rest of the day. You see these 10, 10 12, 14 year olds, this little kid, 10 years old was following me around. And he, I said, yo, bro, what's that big scabs there? He said, I tried to kill myself. I said, why do you want to do that? You're 10 years old. What he said? Nobody loves me. I said, God loves you. I love you. Where's your father? Never knew him. Where's your mother? She's in Chino Women's Prison. How does a 10-year-old process that? This is what you see. These young girls, 13, 14 year old girls, and you know, in the gangs, they have to go have sex with all these other gang members to, to be a member. I mean, it's just insane. Bad from what you can do. Well, I won't let them talk because they're in church. I say, You don't respect me, I don't need your respect. Acts 5 29, in God's approval, not yours, but you will respect the Lord. Otherwise, hit the road. I mean, I'm real firm. And they receive that because most of them in their life have never been told or held accountable. Uh, so that, that's the one thing I tell them. Once I start, there's no talking. And I'll do an hour and a half message, you know, question and answers. And uh, then you see multitudes never forgave themselves there's another prison and they haven't forgiven others that's a big biggest prison one of the guys at county jail just told me he was in there for drugs he started coming to my services and he said to me i was offered drugs twice a day and i turned it down so i really validated him you know that was a good thing and uh most of them, you know, 80-some percent, probably 83 to 87 percent have children. They're serving time. There was a guy down in Texas, uh, his penitentiary. I was waiting for inmates to come. And I see he coming. They had denims. And he, he was like this. He, you couldn't see his, what, under his hand. So I stood sideways right away, you know, a good target. And he's looking at me real tough like a, yo, bro, you might come walking down there, but you ain't going to walk back. So here comes the deputy. What's going on? I said, could you check under his? So the deputy called, there were about three or four of them. He had a knife there. They said, did this, did this chaplain say anything to you? No. Well, why why'd you want to kill him? I never killed a celebrity. Now, he went into the hole, I don't know, seven months, nine months, and when he came out, a couple of the guys that knew me, really liked me, the inmates, broke his arms. That was a message like, Mel Novak comes back, don't even think about it. So, they, when he came out, they broke his arms? Yeah, just, that was a message, yeah. You don't do that. Yeah. You know, it, like, we had... 
stabbings in a church service. You know, last week there were six inmates who jumped on one inmate. He had his young kid get stabbed, 19 years old, in his stomach and neck. They're going to have to move him because they won't miss a second time. This is how it is. Whatever happened to love, whatever happened to integrity, and there's so much anger and pride. It's one guy who got 87-year sentence, and he's walking around like a rooster in a hen house. Yo, bro, why are you walking that way? You just got 87 years. Humility is a strength. Jesus was the epitome of humility. But uh, bless you. It's just important when I go into the service to take authority. Now, there's no deputies in there. I have to sign a paper from taking the hostage. They don't make deals. So if somebody would sneak up with a knife, they'd tell the de deputies, we went out. Sorry, Mel. But God's always protected me, though. I put my whole armor on, which is a command in Ephesians 6, 11. Your spiritual armor. And it's important. you got to be prayed up, suited up, and booted up in those places. Now I always try to make sure nobody's behind me. Um, earlier you mentioned that there were times that something happened and you came home and you were really emotional and uh, you cried. Can you elaborate a little bit on, on that one? Can you, can you go into some details of what happened or... Well, there was, there was two black gals, really sweet ladies, used to come to my service, and I told them, stay away from that. That, that guy is a, is a drug pusher and, and mean. Oh, Brother Mel, we're okay. Well, they got drugs that they were supposed to sell. They sold them, but they kept the money. So he went up there, up on the second floor, put a bullet right between their eyes, threw them out the window. That, that was a message. Do not sell my drugs and don't give me the money. That bothered me. And you see, there was a kid, he, he must have been 16, filthy, dirty, just drugged out. Those are the things that affect you. Women, the third Wednesday I go to Union Rescue Mission, to the men's side and I go to the women's side. You got women who have been uh, abused. Some are mentally unstable. Some addicted. Some are screwed up on meth because they lost their teeth. They have nothing. There was an elderly black woman, precious. She was in her 70s. Had four sons. Two of them had 150 years to life. One had 100 years to life, and the young one had 50 years to life. And she's on Skid Row. Then you see the, some of the guys that were in Vietnam. And, and, you know, it's appalling that our country didn't take care of all those veterans that went to the Vietnam and those places. But this guy, I knew him down there. He was an alcoholic really dirty and I knew something was deadly wrong and one of my messages was God's forgiveness is bigger than your sin and he came up he held my hands his hands was filthy dirty and he tears were bouncing off of my hand can I be forgiven yes he killed a lot of people over there see people don't understand what when our our vets come back, you know, they're emotionally, and there's other, there's a lot of problems. And when you see that, it, it, it just affects me. You see somebody laying on, on a sidewalk there. So, um, so you've been talking a lot about, um, you know, these, these crimes and these things happening, uh, Always. Love is an action, not a lip service. 
Isaiah 29, 13, God says, my people give me lip service. Their, their heart is far from me. And marriages are taking a hit. Where's the love? Abuse. There's too much abuse. I tell those ladies in prison, you're not a doormat, you're not a floor mat, you're not a punching bag. And people respond to love. This is why in Skidrow, they love me there. You know, Hagwa, I never judge anybody. You know, the Bible says, there go I, but for the grace of God, be worried and you stand lest you fall. We're not in their shoes. We don't know. There's people have been molested. Some of those women, it wrecks them. Fathers do that to their children. And, uh, but yeah, two weeks ago, an inmate asked me, what's missing in the world? I told him love. And loss. See, rejection, abandonment, and betrayal is brutal. When you're betrayed, it's like a Judas spirit, and it is painful. I've tasted that pain. I understand it. But it's really, really hard. Uh, you know, in John 3, 16, everybody knows that God so loved the world he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believes on him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God loves us unconditionally. The people will put conditions. And then they, someone with a controlling, demanding, manipulative spirit, that's like witchcraft. Where's the love there? And when you love somebody and all at once they're gone, it tears your heart in shreds. In Psalm 147, 3, God says, I will heal the brokenhearted, bind up their wounds. Jeremiah 30, verse 17, I will restore health to you and heal you of your wounds. You've got wounded people everywhere, at least where I go, walking wounded. And don't know what to do. So this is what I do. I really get down to the nitty gritty and they'll express their pain and hurts to me. Even in the prisons. This one guy told me so many things. That if those inmates in that yard, there was a hundred, there was a thousand guys in there, they'd have killed them in a minute. But they know I'm not going to, they trust. And, uh, Worse than ever. I've been down, you know, I've been doing this a long time. Well, it started out when I was I know, five, a little over five years old. I had, they were an amputee, the doctor wanted to amputate my leg or I was going to die. He gave my mother 12 hours. She wouldn't let him do it. She prayed. And uh, I'm thankful for that mother who loved me enough not to let them do that. And when I played, I was a fast runner. I, Ran 100 yards in 9.6, in the 40, 4.5 in the 40. And because I had a mother that would let them amputate my leg. And I guess the tough one was when I had, from 18 years of age to 28, I had 10 throat surgeries. You couldn't talk for seven weeks at a time. And then people would say, oh, look at that nice looking young man. He's deaf and dumb. I wanted to say, no, I'm not, but I couldn't talk. And, uh, but the, the most difficult one to answer your question was I wanted to play pro ball since I was three years old. All I wanted to do was play ball. In football, I had, I had all those scholarships all over. I even had an appointment to Annapolis, all over the country, made, you know, Michigan, Michigan State, uh, Florida State, Florida, Miami, uh, Stanford, Pitt, all these big universities. My mother cried. She said, Mel, go get your, your, your education. What if I get hurt playing football? I never got hurt in football. I played offense and defense. I was a flanker and uh, made all the all-star teams and everything. And something inside me, I had to go sign that pro baseball contract. A year and a half later, I was a cripple. This was the hardest thing for me that I could remember. We go from like a world-class athlete, all at once I'm a cripple. And my, I went from 180, and I played uh, ball, I was 185. I went down to one, I had like a 
37 pound cast, body cast for I think seven weeks. I went down to like 159 pounds. My arm was like a, it was like a, a little nothing. And I thought when they were going to take my cast off, I'm going to throw the ball around. When they took the cast off and went to put my arm in, in a sling, it was so painful, I passed out. Then this doctor said to me, look, kid, you think you're ever going to play ball or do anything again? Forget it. You're going to be a cripple for the rest of your life. That was brutal. And I, I mean, I was just, everything was gone. Scholarships, college, pro ball, everything. That was the toughest part. Normally, 97% will turn to drugs or alcohol to numb the pain, escape, medicate it. I didn't, but I still struggled. I was angry. Uh, I was bitter. I was uh, all the things you're not supposed to be. It took like seven years to overcome it. And I, I uncrippled all the exercise. It took me six years. And I went to a small school called Geneva. It's a Christian school in Beaver Falls, Pennsylvania. And I was third in the country, pass catching and kicking. Got turned in for being a professional. That's when I moved out here. So uh, when you have surgery that hinders for what you love to do or you want to do, it's difficult. I don't care who it is. There was a guy, I think, for USC, a pitcher, when his arm got destroyed, he killed himself on a pitcher mound. Remember that? That was... Yeah, I never ever thought about suicide. LA County Jail, we have a new module. Got 30 guys in there, your guys' age. All of them attempted suicide one, two, or three times. This is how it is. I can guarantee you, most of these things, no love. Loss of something. Love lost. And I struggled with that losing my baseball career and I uh, always wondered which college I was going to go either at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Florida, University of Florida or Michigan. I'll never know. It's too late. It's like the snowflake. Too late. But, you know, my mother and father were supportive. I mean, they, they really felt bad. And the thing that hurt me was there was some people in my town that was glad that I failed. That still hurts me. Why people would do that? That was that was something that affected me. Why did they want to help you fail? Jealousy, something. They didn't want me to succeed. There's nobody in that town. Then after I left, all at once I'm out here and I've done all these movies. I always wondered about the same people. What do they think? It just, it's, it hurts. It hurts when, you know, somebody, I have a lot of people I pray for that have devastating diseases and attacks on their body and everything. And I, I can't understand why somebody would, would be glad. I was walking around with that big cast. And so, oh, I, I didn't think you were hurt. But again, where's the love? And where I came from, people drank. That was their place to escape. 
I got beer joints everywhere. They call them beer joints back there. <laughs> so, how long did it take for you to get over this frustration to heal? It took a long time. Since I've been in ministry, I've learned yesterday's gone never to return. Tomorrow's not promised. Proverbs 27.1, don't boast about tomorrow. We don't know what a day brings. Uh, three of the times I almost died happened so fast. That's why I tell people, hey, every day of life is a blessing. What are you going to do with it? We can't change yesterdays. And I, st I was stuck in the past for too long of what could be. We can't change it. This is what I, every, every uh, chapel service I do in prisons or skid row, Isaiah 43, 18, I give them. Remember not the former things, nor consider the things of old. For God said, Behold, I will do a new thing. Good boy, you stay in the past, there's nothing but defeat. Ang anxiety, worry, fretting, stress, and tension come along with it. And that's why you know, in, in, in the film industry, you never know when you're going to get something good. But I, I see what happened to so many people, so I'm not going to get bummed out because I didn't get a part. I mean, in 2014, I didn't do one, certain, one movie. But I did 268 services. Been to Pelican Bay every year for 10 years, the worst one in the country. So that all helped me overcome because... Uh, it was almost like baseball was like a god to me. And anything to alienate your affection from God becomes idol worship. I mean, I was taken down like an oak tree. I went from a real tough, tough football player and everything to a cripple. This is why when I see somebody crippled, I'm always reaching out to them because I understand. You know, it, it's, it's very difficult there's things you can do. Some people who had a stroke, all at once they're walking funny or hardly walking. See, this is why you, you got to count your blessings. You can see, I tell those inmates, you can see, walk, talk, and hear, go to the bathroom both ways. You better, you better thank God for that. I had a guy did a, he had a small part in a movie with me. And he and his wife came to hear me minister to, as, as a guest somewhere. He had his big lump. I said, yo, bro, what's that big lump you got? He had a colostomy. So, you, you know, they sew your butt up. You can't. You got a bag. And he passed away like nine months later. Life's precious. I've been in 12 different states. Yeah. Level three, level four penitentiaries. Yeah. Uh, New York. Like Florida has like 75 penitentiaries. I've been to every level three, level four in this state, from San Quentin, mm -hmm. uh, Pelican Bay, all of them. But Rawway, New Jersey, uh, New York, Pennsylvania, Florida, Alabama, Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, Nevada, Washington's Walla Walla. That's a level four. And Oregon. I've been to uh, in, uh, Belfast, Ireland. Been to Mexico. There's some nasty prisons there, man. Oh, I, I can imagine. When I was down there, these two, two white guys were in there. Yo, bro, what are you doing down here, man? Well, it was drugs. What are you going to do when you get out? We're never going to come back to Mexico, I'll tell you that. The Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. I was never alone, Hebrews 13, 5. And I couldn't have gone through those things without them. This is what I do with the inmates. You know, you got to repent, turn it around 180 degrees, and uh, spend time with them and invite them in your heart as Lord and Savior and really want to be healed. Because I know people who don't. See, on Skid Row, you see hopelessness, the most devastating emotion in the world. Hopelessness. 
And if I bring them hope, I'm really good at encouraging, edifying, uplifting. I use probably 100 to 120 scriptures in every message. That blows them away. I don't talk about movies. Because you got people who are really struggling in life. So what do you mean by you really want to be healed? Well, in John chapter 5, Jesus, Jesus Christ asked his paralytic of 38 years a strange question. Do you want to be healed? That means once he got healed, he'd have to do something, take up his mat and do something and follow because we're all called to serve. Matthew 20, 28, Mark 10, 45. Everybody. But you got people, like there was a guy who was so close to leading him to the Lord, he was a heroin addict. And he said, I never had anybody put it like you did. It was really great. He says, but I got to be honest with you. Tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, I got to have my heroin fixed. And that's the choice drugs of teenagers now, heroin. So, it's crucial to understand, you know, to admit, remit, submit, and commit it to the Lord. They'll nurse it, curse it, and rehearse it. Only God can reverse it. But the thing is, what I encourage them, nothing's impossible with God, Luke 1, 37. Nothing's too hard for him, Jeremiah 32, 17, and 27. And it doesn't show partiality or favoritism. Romans 2, 2, 11, Acts 10, 34. So it's a choice. You want to, I told him, this one inmate come to county jail, I said, yo, bro, how many times you been here? He's counting. 20 times. I said, Wolfgang Puck doesn't make the food. That's no silly apostrophic mattress. To come in there with all the danger and jeopardy, it's a bad choice. So, uh, the walking wounded, it's a constant. The anger, uh, but bitterness is a poison. So you see people get sick. Uh, Acts 8, 23, poisoned by bitterness, bound by iniquity. It all comes down to what do I want to do with my life? Because my life is short on this planet. And it's very effective because I'm always encouraging and you have worth and value. Jeremiah 29, 11. You're not a failure. I asked him at once, sir, anybody think they're a failure? I said, put your hand down. There's no failures. We've all failed in something. You could use this as an experience to move on to what God has for you. And then he told me after the service, it was the first time in 25 years that he didn't think he was a failure. He said he used to look in a mirror and say, you're a failure, you're a loser, and he'd do his heroin. Ten years before I even started that, I used to encourage people because I had, you know, still had my leg. I could talk. I was hit in the eye with a 90 mile an hour racquetball, ripped my eye. And any doctor will tell you if it's torn like an, like an S, you have to have surgery. If it's torn straight up and down, it may heal in five weeks of medication. Mine was healed in 16 hours. Blew them away. That was a miracle. So, I always would run into people who were really down. You know, when I talk about the deadly Ds, they get hit with disappointment, discouragement, doubt, discontent, despair, despondency, disillusionment, demoralization, rejection, depression. Depression is real, but it comes from the devil. And it's, it's devastating. In our country, between Thanksgiving and Christmas, every year, four to 500,000 attempt suicide. So I knew I had some kind of calling. I didn't really know what. But when I went to that Union Rescue Mission as a celebrity, because I'm not into that, you know, sometimes the people... They said, oh, you're a legend. They're going like that. I said, please don't bow down to me. You only bow down to the Lord. When, when er, all those doors kept opening up, I knew that's what I'm supposed to do. It's a calling. Everybody has a calling. Now, 
usually people have a skid row ministry or a prison ministry. God gave them both to me. Open up all the doors. And that's when I knew that I knew that I knew. And then once you enter that, enter that's a war. Second Corinthians 10, 3. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not work in the flesh. If you're a threat to the kingdom of darkness, you're going to get hit. And I've had a lot of surgeries. Uh, it, it's a battlefield. The Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. But that's what I knew that I knew. And, you know, I was married. She didn't want me in ministry. Didn't want me in movies. And she left. That was another brokenness, broken heart. It was very difficult. But I raised my two daughters, and I got a incredible relationship with them. So that was the good thing that happened. See, I, I do this when I counsel, and I do a radio show called Amiga Man. It goes all over the world. And to encourage people that, you know, God loves them with an everlasting love, Jeremiah 31, 3, there's that word again. But without him, it's not going to work. Because healing, well, number one, he's a God of miracles. Malachi 3, 6, Hebrews 13, 8, never changes. But see, the devil comes in with doubt. And this is why you got people who start committing suicide. They're devastated with this or they're OD on drugs. But the main thing is for them, just open up their hearts. It has nothing to do with religion or denomination, nothing. It's a personal, intimate relationship with, with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Acts 4.12, there's no name of the salvation. May I be saved except the name of Jesus. I've seen people, lives totally change, get healed, marriages healed, bodies healed, uh, miracles upon miracles upon, and, and I've had more miracles than I deserve. But this is the key. Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. All these other things be added unto you. Nothing to do with religion or denomination. They don't save. And once they do that and say, Lord, I just surrender everything. I have a whole bunch of people right now on my prayer list that has cancer. I was healed of cancer. And I know that they can be I prayed with some people, they got healed, other people, they didn't. I led them to the Lord, so they got promoted. Absent from the body, present with the Lord, 2 Corinthians 5, 8. And I don't know anybody, I know a lot of people, I don't know anybody that hasn't gone through really big disappointments. Uh, because when that anxiety comes in, rips off your peace, you get headaches, high blood pressure, Irritable bowel syndrome. That's from anxiety. That's a fiery dart to the devil. Philippians 4, 6 is be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make a request known to God. Anxiety is eating people up. Then here comes the cousin, worry. Worry short circuits God's promises. And then they start fretting. Psalm 37, 8. Cease from fretting, it causes harm. And now they're wavering in their faith. James 1 8, a double minded man is unstable in all, its, all their ways. But see, doubt is the killer. Fear is the killer. It all comes from the devil. Things that I wouldn't, I wish it didn't happen losing my baseball career, being crippled, going through some really hard uh, surgeries, and having the cancer. And also, I wished I wouldn't have had a divorce. You know, I have marks, wounds, and scars. God's not worried about this. What, what, what did I do with them? See, if people don't give up all the anger and unforgiveness and resentment and hostility, it'll turn into bitterness, and that bitterness will make you sick, literally. So those are the issues. But again, I can't think about what could have been. I don't, I don't want to go back there anymore. This is how it is. This is what I'm doing. And uh, 
I go, I go to minister where people won't go or don't care about it. And these are, this kid wrote, this, those people laying on the street, at one time they were a baby that a mother held. They have feelings. They want to be loved. They, a lot of them don't want to be addicted. And this is where God put me. But look what I had to go through for me to understand. So he always has a plan and purpose. Uh, Jeremiah 29, 11 and Psalm 32, 8. He says, Mel, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you go. I will guide you with my eye. This is what he did. That was never a plan. If you'd have told me all those years ago, oh, Mel, you're going to be a Skid Row prison minister. I'd say, who is this guy? Are you kidding me? But you know what? It's, it's the best thing I ever did. All the movies, all the accolades, all that other stuff. When you see a human being, it's like I took my daughter to get f tires at Firestone. And it, the manager was a black guy, and he came over to me and he said, Can I talk to you? I said, Sure. He says, You don't remember me, do you? And I said, No, I'm sorry, I don't. He said, I lost my wife, my home, my business. To cocaine. I was sitting on a curb, the Fred Jordan Mission, and he says, You came out there and you say, Hey, bro, you need to come in here and hear, hear some of that encouraging word. He says, I sat there saying, I can't believe I'm on Skid Row. I can't believe. He came in, gave his life to the Lord. He's been clean from cocaine. He got that really good job as a manager back together with his wife they have their own place see everybody's not going to get free freedom and liberation but there are so many to do uh, i was with my daughter leah and had a little grandkid and we i took she was down here took her to the pancake house and as we're walking down she said to me tata there's four gangbangers following us. I said, get behind me. So I stood back there. And one of them said, hey, chaplain, it's me, Hector. He said, I wanted you to meet my cousins. We're all doing the Arsenal prayer. It was hilarious. And my daughter just, she says, no matter where I go, somebody knows you. And that, that's, that's what makes you feel good. People can change and get turned around. I was at Applebee's with this gal, sitting out there, and, and this, this young, looked like a gangbanger, dressed real nice. He said, can I talk to you? I said, sure. He says, you led me to the Lord in there. You gave me that arsenal prayer, and you encouraged me. So I, this is my wife and two kids, little kids. He said, I'm totally clean. We're back together. It, it was like incredible. And she, she was crying. She came and hugged me. That's why I will continue to go. There's always someone who needs an encouraging word, who needs to be healed, restored, and that's what I do. Even in these movies, I led two of the directors to the Lord in, in these five movies. Uh, and Wardrobe girl, uh, makeup girl, and some kid, he was an extra. He was an extra in the Syndicate Smasher. I had one more scene to do, and I'm finished with the whole movie, so I was sitting there like tired. He comes over, he goes, Oh, it's an honor to meet you. I said, Don't bow. No bowing to me. And he, so finally he says, Do you have any tips? for an actor. I says, yeah, Matthew 6, 33. He says, what? I says, put God first. And uh, I ended up helping him. And then after a month, he had no food or anything. God says, look, you need to go back home, save money for nine months of rent, food and everything. I, I, I bought him a bus ticket, gave him money for food, 
people think, oh, I can be a star. I had a guy in the penitentiary, a real tough dude. He had like four front teeth missing. He said, hi, how could I be a movie star? And I was thinking, oh, man. First thing you got to do is get out of here, bro. Why do you want to be a star? Why don't you just be an actor? I want success and prosperity. I said, that's Joshua 1.8. But you've got to follow God daily and constantly in his word and let him do what he does best. Success and prosperity will follow. He goes, oh, amazing. You're in a penitentiary. You want to know how you can be a movie star? <laughs>